Our next uh, speaker is the CEO of uh, Seaborg Technology, a Copenhagen-based company. I'd like to invite uh, Trolls to come speak. I'm, uh, I'm Trolls. Uh, I have a PhD from Risø, which is the old experimental facility we had in Denmark. Um, unfortunately, they only do renewable energy now, uh, so no nuclear. They have a lab that does some experiments with medical isotopes, but that's it. Anyway, I was uh, lucky to get a PhD involved with the European Spallation Source, so I got my PhD in Neutronics, doing the moderator for them. And uh, back then, we in 2014, me and, and uh, some of my colleagues founded Seaborg. The reason we uh, decided to uh, found Seaborg was basically this. I mean, there's a lot of people in this world, and we need water for them, we need food for them, we need prosperity for them, and we need sanitation and lo uh, logistical networks and everything. There's a lot of things we need, and when you look at it, all of it comes down to energy. Energy is just everything. It's the fundamental resource in this world. People think it's money. Well, money is what pays for energy. Energy is the fundamental resource. So the good news is we are getting more and more energy in the world. So more and more people are coming out of, of poverty. And if you look at China, they have had 800 million people crossing the poverty limit over the last few decades. But there's also a bad side of the story. And this is, of course, what we're trying to fight. So this poses a dilemma. What is sustainability? Is it sustainable if we just can reduce the energy and air or, or CO2 emissions? Or is it sustainable if we find a, a, a way to make these people actually prosper and have food and water? That's a very important question. And it's a dilemma because they are actually not aligned. They you will not solve both problems with the current technologies. So this brings us to our vision, which is, uh, I would say, a little bit ambitious, but we're allowed to. What we're seeing out there is that the politicians are not ch changing this problem. It's not being changed by itself. Something needs to be moved. So the hypothesis behind uh, this company is basically that if you deliver something um, which is cheap enough, then you will enable the market to fight it themselves. So if the, if the energy solution is cheap enough, then the market will itself be able to solve both emission and poverty issues. So and how are we doing that? Well, we're doing it in a molten salt reactor. And as you may know, molten salt reactor is a fundamentally different uh, type of nuclear reactor. It's actually been tested three times, at least, maybe more. We don't know. There were reasons it wasn't built back then, and, and some of them might be solvable today. Three big selling points in, uh, in molten salt reactors. They cannot be used for nuclear weapons. That's not true for all molten salt reactors, but that's true depending on the fuel cycle. You can pick your fuel cycle and design the design or the reactor such that, that uh, it's very unfavorable for weapons. Uh, you would basically rather start with a pile of granite uh, than, than with, one of the, with the fuel from one of these reactors. So it can be very proliferation resistant. We can use thorium. Um, there's no incentive in doing so. Thorium is not easy. It gives a lot of new chemistry problems. And, and I'm going to go through some upsides in this talk, and none of those have anything to do with thorium. Thorium has one upside, and it, it exists in China in larger amounts than uranium. And it, it, it is more abundant in the Earth crust. So it is a resource that can stretch the sustainability of nuclear into the hundreds of thousands of years, instead of just the tens of thousands that you can achieve with uranium. Then it can burn nuclear waste. A lot of reactors can do that, but uh, molten salt reactors are actually particularly favorable for this because they have uh, a very good neutron economy, uh, at least on a long time scale. So, so they can be used for waste burning. So we can actually help some of the old technologies to get back to being sustainable because the long-lived waste is not uh, considered sustainable. And then this is the kicker that everybody loves, that uh, they cannot melt down or explode. And, and I actually think it deserves uh, a slide for itself, so I did. Cannot melt down, it's nice. I've heard it said before that it's already liquid. But OK, what is a meltdown really? That's an accident where you have a radiation release. Molten salt reactors have a very hard time of getting salt released because they have such high boiling points. So in that way, it's, it's kind of meltdown proof, even though it's molten. Typical uh, issues in a, in a molten salt reactor are caused by the meltdown, but the meltdown is caused by something else. And, and in particular, uh, the fact that light water reactors operate at tremendous pressure is an issue. And this is, this is why they're built so complicated to, to handle these pressure issues. In a molten salt reactor, you don't need pressure uh, because it has such a high boiling point. So basically, uh, no pressure explosions. That's nice. Um, then another thing is that you don't produce hydrogen. A second issue in a light water reactor is when the temperature starts to rise, if you have some issues with cooling, the temperature starts to rise. And once you reach around 700 degrees, you have hydrogen being uh, produced from the steam in contact with the 
uh, fuel rods. And hydrogen is just that nice. And, and while you're producing this hydrogen, you also produce oxygen. That takes additional a lot of systems to, to ensure safety there. And, and all of these systems turns into cost. And then what I consider the kicker statement in molten salt reactors, which people kind of uh, uh, oversee or, or, or ignore, is that the elements that are produced during the fission, they're actually very radioactive. In a light water reactor, most of these are contained as a gas in the lattice. If the lattice breaks down, which it does because it cracks all the time uh, due to internal pressure, uh, these gases come out. And, and my, many of these elements are very volatile in, the, in water and in air. So that means air and water is easy dispersion mechanisms for them. That means if you have something from the core of the reactor coming in contact with the environment, it's dispersed very easily. In a, a molten salt reactor, this, they're, they're, the dispersion mechanisms are suppressed. There are a few that comes out of the, of the salt, but most of them react with the fluorides that is in excess after the fission and, and form stable salts. And you can actually go out here, there's a lot of rocks, there's all the fluorides. That's, that's salts like that. It's salts that are stable enough that you can throw them in water and they will stay there for, for millions of years. Um, so it's a very stable uh, liquid. And those that come out, the, the noble gases, it's, first it's very small quantities, second it only comes out during operation. So you can just pull them out and treat them while operating. They don't build up. That means that no matter what accident you actually imagine, and I mean they are very resistant to accident due to these uh, elements and because they inherently can control themselves. But no matter what accident you actually can imagine, if a terrorist drops a, a dynamite, or if that plane was made of lead and, and actually went through the, the shell of, uh, of the containment building, then these salts are released into the environment and they solidify and that's it. You don't have a gas cloud drifting around the world. That's a, that's a really, 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 really big game changer. Like in really big, because in the existing nuclear industry, all the innovation has been around safety because you have an unstable system with dire consequences of disaster. And so all your innovation is making that system stable. And they managed to do that. But in the process, they made these gigantic plants that doesn't really have a fit into the market and, and are very expensive. They, they are actually compatible to, uh, uh, with coal, but they are extremely poor economics because which market needs four gigawatts installed overnight? It's, it's just hard to imagine. So it's very hard to make uh, modern reactors economical. Other things that you get from the liquid fuel, which I would call a major upside, is that you can extract the heat from the liquid itself, from, from the fuel itself. We actually have two liquids, so that's, uh, but, but uh, you can extract it from the fuel itself. First off, it means that you can ha have higher power density. In a light water reactor, again, or in, in, in solid fuel reactors, you need the heat out of the fuel. In doing so, you need to exchange with the environment. That takes, that's in the second uh, time scale. So it takes time, and then you need to transport it out. When you transport the heat directly out, your maximum temperature and your output temperature is the same. In a, in a light water reactor, for comparison, the, the center of the rod is around 2,000 uh, centigrade, while the output is around 300. So here we can just, if we operate it at 900, it's 900. If we operate it at 700, it's 700. You don't have uh, huge peaks in temperature. That's engineers like that. Then you do homogeneous burnout. So you don't have all the flux centered in the center of the reactor, only burning the fuel in the center. Because the fuel circulates, you can burn all the fuel homogeneously. That's a nice neutronic feature. This is also why, if I am to mention thorium, this is why thorium makes sense here. Because thorium, you will need access to that fuel. That gives a lot of political uh, issues, but you will need access to that fuel. And you can do that because it's a fluid, and you actually have access to the fluid if you want to. Another one that people miss is that in a, in a live water reactor, it, it's not because the reactor fails to shut down. It's the heating that comes after you shut down the reactor that, that melts it down. It's called the residual decay heat. But in a molten salt reactor, this is diluted. So instead of having a high power where the power used to be, you get it diluted into the full system. So you have a much smaller power density in the, in the residual heat or from the residual heat. Again, because they don't have to heat exchange before the temperature response is there, they just, the, the temperature response is virtually instant. When your salt heats up, it expands. This expansion expels fuel from the core and that reduces reactivity. So the reactor shuts down. So 
if you have an unexpected temperature increase or something else, the reactor will, will basically shut down itself. And also you can use that to regulate it on the, on the pumps as uh, you explained. Then there's the fact that, again, back to the heat exchange, uh, that you do not have to, um, to optimize for heat exchange because if you look at the optimal configuration of, of a reactor or a reactor with, uh, with a hydrogen-based moderator, you'll see that it has some region where it's critical here. You'll see it has some region where the re reactivity is negative. That means that it shuts itself down. You want to be in that region. But because you need to heat exchange, you need to have the smallest possible tubes to maximize your surface area. So a light water reactor actually ends up all the way there. And this is not going uh, in this direction. So the further out here you get, the more fuel you put into your, your core. The more fuel you have in your core, the better uh, fuel economy, the better neutral economy, and the better power per unit core. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, uh, the rods from a light water reactor, but they are like one centimeter rods, four meters high. These are actually uh, nine centimeters and uh, only two meters tall. So nine, nine centimeter diameter. We are running a liquid moderator, and that's our big innovation. I said earlier that there were good reasons to shut down the, uh, the molten salt reactor experiment. I think it should have been continued out of academic uh, reasons, but if you have a technology which is that promising, then why didn't it happen? The industry must have known that it was this promising, and they would have commercialized it if it was just that easy. So there were reasons it didn't happen. And those reasons were based on, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm saying two things. One was that, well, a molten salt reactor, it's a liquid neutronic system, so you need a much harder uh, uh, simulation. And that's something that was unavailable at the computers at the time. A lot could be solved with, uh, with old tools, but uh, today we have the computers, and we are, we are building the software, so, so we are getting there. Uh, so now we can simulate them. That's important because then you can go directly commercial. The other thing is that it uses graphite, and graphite just doesn't have a long li lifetime. And in a, in a solid fuel reactor where you have water and graphite or, or similar, then graphite expansion doesn't change a lot. But when your graphite expands or contracts in a molten salt reactor, then you expel or pull in fuel. That means your reactivity goes up or down. And the problem with graphite is that the, depending on the re irradiation you give it, this response will change. So in the beginning, it might be a positive response. Then later, it'll be a negative or vice versa. And you really don't want positive responses because that means any small deviation in temperature will kind of escalate uh, this. So that, that limits uh, graphite very much in lifetime, and it's problematic. So we, we made a new moderator, which is a liquid that gives some other uh, upsides. It also gives some new problems because now we need a uh, material to uh, separate the two liquids. So there, there are new issues. But luckily, that's not my issues. I'm the, just the CEO. Uh, Dan, our chemist, is here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> he will tell you more about it tomorrow. <laughs> so who are we? We are currently 16 employed. I will note that we are employed with a salary. That's, uh, that's something which is uh, outstanding a little bit in this community. We have uh, eight PhD, uh, PhDs on the team, and we are people from four continents, which uh, I think is nice, so we're pretty international. Then we have, uh, right now we have actually one of each, um, but, but we typically have some students coming and going. Unfortunately, we are so many now at the office that we don't have space for more than a couple of students, so hopefully we'll change that soon. We started out by specializing in tech. I'm a physicist, the entire team was uh, tech people. We only just recently hired the first who, who knows anything about business. Um, we learned, but, uh, but apparently uh, there's a lot to learn. So we had to hire help. I will say we, we have become world leading in neutronics. Uh, that was one of our first achievements. Today we actually have experiments in the lab. That's, that's great. Again, Dan will tell you more about that tomorrow. And hopefully we will build a new lab soon, it's something that we are, we are playing with because the, the chemistry in, in a molten salt reactor is hard and it's even harder if you want to bring a new liquid moderator. Then we are engaged with the supply chain in, in uh, East Asia. I think Europe is a little bit uh, unambitious. Uh, it, actually, I think the Western world is a little bit unambitious, so, so uh, that's, that's where to do it. And, um, and they have the power out there to both uh, help us develop and help us test. And they, they can license and manufacture, which is uh, something that we cannot do as a small company. And then we are in dialogue with a customer. We have actually been for a while, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge uh, company, and, and they are adding advisors and stuff to us now. So, but it's early stage. Uh, these two, 
uh, I would call them major uh, company milestones, also the experiment. But these two are really important, and that's, that's what will ultimately bring us to market, hopefully. Uh, our funding is mainly from private investors. We have a little bit of public funding. I would like it to remain mainly from pi private investors, so I, uh, I don't want to go and find uh, 100 million out in Europe. Uh, I want to find most of it from private and then back it with um, public funding. So this is when we started. Uh, in 2015, we drew, drew this. We started in 2014, but we only made the drawing in 2015. Our reactor looked like this. It, uh, I think it's very beautiful. I did. The, I made the drawing. And 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 I, I mean, we found us. We thought it was impossible. We just also realized that if you look around, I mean, it's it's a dire state. You have to do something. So we just had to try, and we tried, and uh, and we was like, okay, we're going to have fun doing this, and. And we certainly had. And then the university came around and said, well, we might have to fire you if, uh, if people figure out that you do this. So we went to the media, and the media treated us positive. And I think we were actually probably the first company that was founded, or nuclear company founded in Denmark, since the anti-nuclear movement, which was by chance founded in Denmark. So it started out as impossible. And suddenly, it just looked extremely hard. It looked like it could actually be done. And now we have investors and ongoing stuff. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> still very hard, but hopefully in uh, in a year I will come back and say that it was it's still fairly hard. So that's where I will stop. Take a couple questions. So if I understand correctly, you have your molten fuel inside the tube, and next year you have the latest moderator. Yes. And what is that moderator? Because I think I have missed it. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> we have a patent, and it's actually, it's been, uh, it was, uh, we got the evaluation back half a year ago that uh, it is uh, valid for patenting. But we don't have to publish it yet, so we are giving it some time because, I mean, we are obviously fencing a little bit around it. So I will go back to the question I had in mind. What about vapor explosions? So it's a high temperature ionic liquid, I will tell you that, and it's hydrogen based. Now you know almost everything. You can go and guess it yourself. So you don't have that issue, no. Is your vision to build uh, multiple units in a plant, or is it a single unit, 100 megawatts? You mean our, our fit in the supply chain? Um, we, we, we plan, we're actually adopting it a little bit from Danish Vestas. They had huge success in the wind industry by doing something quite simple. Just you have sub-supplies delivering components to your facility. You have a crane in the facility, you assemble it. You have some key elements that are your IP, and then you ship it down the, the supply chain. It's, it's the same we basically want to do. So when, when I'm saying that this small module here, it's, uh, that's, that's all, all inside that will be built by us in in the collaboration with subcontractors. And then that will be shipped to some big uh, guys, like whatever, some huge company that knows how to build uh, boilers and all that. That's it, there's nothing new in that. These big guys, they want to sell more boilers. So uh, there's a business case in it for them. So <laughs> but, but of course, we should, uh, we should maintain our IP, and we do that by having this module is ours, only ours. All right, let's thank our speaker again.